welcome everybody um, to our second Current and Emerging Threats to Crops Innovation Lab seminar. And we were really happy with how the first one went and we want to continue this process. So today we will be discussing the emerging role of artificial intelligence in current and emerging threats to crops. Of course, we're all very familiar with the important and dominating role that AI has come to play in our daily lives across the globe. And this represents an unparalleled opportunity for countries in the global south and particularly feed the future countries where USAID is interested in to help them increase food production. And one of those really clear examples is from East Africa, where a virus, the banana bungee top virus, is moving across the landscape at, at speed. And we've talked about that in their newsletters, and we want to spend time understanding that with the people we have here. So we have a, a Junior Desanjo uh, from the Tanzanian USAID mission. Uh, we have Pete McCloskey from Plan Village at Penn State and the current Emerging Threats to Crops Innovation Lab at Penn State. And we have Milsort Kemboy and Irene Moretti, who are from Plan Village, Kenya and are working as sub-awardees as part of the Current and Emerging Threats to Crops Innovation Lab, and Annalise Kays, who is the Director of Operations at both Plant Village as well as the Current and Emerging Threats to Crops Innovation Lab. So we'll start off with, with some reflections from Junior uh, from his perspective at, as USAID Tanzania on banana budget up virus, and then the engineering team will come in and, and explain to us uh, the different components of AI. Please do put any questions into the uh, chat box so we can address those at the end of their presentation. So thank you, Junior, for taking the time. We're really honored to have you here and over to you for some reflections on BBTV in Tanzania and AI generally. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much, David, uh, for having me and the opportunity to present. Uh, so basically, I'll just give an overview about uh, uh, the current situation in terms of the banana bungee top virus in the country. And uh, just, just to start on, on, a, on a high note, uh, uh, maybe just for the benefit of for all the listeners, uh, currently Tanzania ranks as the largest uh, banana producing, as the ninth uh, uh, producing, largest producing banana country uh, to in all the Africa. And uh, the actual annual production, we produce around 3.5 million tons every single year. Uh, but also the banana production has uh, significantly been increasing in terms of uh, increasing the income to the Tanzanian economy and currently ranked as the third important crop after maize and rice and provides, a, uh, I'd say, an employment of around uh, to, to 900,000 900, uh, households. So this is to say that uh, it is one of the crops, uh, food security crops that is dependent by most uh, farming households. But also uh, more than 60% of the banana in Tanzania has been cultivated in two particular areas. Uh, this is uh, Kilimanjaro. This is one region, but also another region is called uh, is also called Kagera and Bea. These have been areas which, uh, and also Kigoma uh, in the southwest. And these have been uh, the few regions which have been massively uh, producing uh, the banana that we consume for food security, but also for further export. So basically, uh, just that, that's, a, that's an overview of what uh, the banana industry is and how important it is for Tanzanian, uh, Tanzanian, uh, Tanzanians uh, as overall. But uh, just to set a scene in terms of the banana bungee top virus, this is something that uh, has been uh, been a very, very more most serious threat in the country. But uh, in terms of in the country in Tanzania, but also other particular countries, and it has it was first known at Egypt. Uh, the, this was around 1920, and around 1960 it was reported in DRC Congo. And then other furthermore places like uh, Gabon, Burundi, and Malawi, also it was known to have erupted to these areas. Furthermore, uh, and uh, the statistics show that uh, after the emergence of the banana bungee top virus, it has led to a loss of around 100 to 600 million, uh, uh, million dollars 
uh, in Africa annually. And this is due to uh, the effects of the banana budget of virus. So basically, this has been, uh, th this is the, uh, I would say, the trajectory in terms of the if impact of it uh, to the product, to the banana, ba banana ba production in the country, but of course at large in Africa. And as we know, and I believe most of us would know that the spread of uh, the banana banjito virus is mostly due to the uh, vector by the banana aphids, which are the ones which basically, uh, uh, as I say, as a reactive agent that makes uh, the, the banana spread, the banana banjito to spread a lot. But furthermore, uh, we have seen that one of the other key issues that contribute to the banana banjito uh, virus uh, is the movement of planting materials uh, from places which are affected to the places which are, uh, are not affected. And this has been a cultural practice in most of the uh, country where uh, people would go and uh, source planting materials from places which uh, which they tend to be like rural areas and bring them to the urban areas. And furthermore, to places where they have, there's an abundance of uh, bananas being produced. And this has been one of the key sources that has led to, uh, to the to 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 the in terms of uh, the spread of banana banjito virus, and it has also been said in terms of that different studies that have been done that it uh, the the banana banjito virus reduces uh, the production by ninety to one hundred percent. So when it affects the farm, it totally diminishes everything, and there's no fruit that can happen can be produced from the farm after uh, the emergence of the banana banjito virus. Uh, and these these are, these are the kinds of effects that basically have been, uh, we have been observing and seen even in different fields in Tanzania, including Kilimanjaro, but also in Kigoma. Uh, we all know that it was first reported uh, to occur in Wuhigo, Kigoma. This was the first incident that, that was on around December 20th to January 2021. And of course, a number of agencies uh, responded to that to make sure that they do follow-up surveys. That is uh, the Tanzania Agricultural Research Institute, the Tanzania Pest, uh, uh, Pesticides uh, Control Institute, but also the International uh, uh, International Institute for Tropical Agriculture. And a number of surveys were done. Uh, we the delimination surveys were done by the institution Institute of uh, the International Institute of uh, Tropical Agriculture, where thirty one regions were were surveyed, and uh, uh, twelve out of them were detected to 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 be infected by uh, banana banjito virus. So. It's a serious thing, and uh, we need to take uh, uh, firm actions as as of now. And uh, basically, uh, just in a nutshell, that is the situation that we have been facing in terms of banana. Uh, there was one of the case studies that was uh, actually being presented, uh, where a press, uh, one of the farmers used to harvest around 150 ba bunches of bananas every single year from his farm. And this was before uh, the BBTV. But after the BBTV, uh, uh, basically, uh, the farmer lost his income totally and he is now looking for employment in different places. So, so we can see how the situation is uh, has been uh, has been really chaotic uh, to most of our livelihood and our farmers in the country. And basically, uh, uh, there have been... Uh, initiatives and we as USAID uh, thought that we should uh, support in terms of uh, coming up with a response uh, so as to eliminate the banana banjito virus and we saw basically uh, how can we combat the banana banjito virus and we thought of four key actions that we should take. One is to, is to create and to support uh, uh, a regional technical working group that will contain uh, the banana budget of virus spread, but also sustain management, uh, management actions and even advocacy. But furthermore, create awareness. Most people are not aware of the disease. Uh, how about uh, what's the dimension of this threat, but also the mitigation actions that can be taken uh, for various bananas and other farmers. 
And furthermore, uh, another action was to organize uh, BBTV eliminating and the detection surveys and also to rehabilitate the affected areas uh, uh, so that we can basically, uh, they can basically uh, start again the production. And furthermore, is the capacity building uh, in terms of uh, capacity development of BBTV detection, surveillance control, but also the production of virus-free in terms of cleaning materials, uh, these which can be now uh, taken to the places where they have been uprooted, the affected ones have been uprooted, but also creating awareness in terms of advocacy uh, at a larger scale in terms of the national uh, wide, but even in the regional space. Yeah, so basically these are just a few reflections. And this is what USAID we have been doing uh, over the last two weeks. We had a very, uh, very fruitful meeting down in Moshi with uh, different countries. This was Uganda, Kenya, and uh, Tanzania where we reflected on the key actions that we should take. And these actions were actually more or less the same, but different because of our different areas. For example, currently in Tanzania, we know that the BBTV has been spreading at a high pace, but with our friends in Kenya, the BBTV has not yet reached to their land. And, but in, for Uganda, they have been also experiencing some effects of the BBTV. So we decided to create what uh, implementation plans for each country and see on the best ways to do prevention to uh, to containment but also furthermore to make sure that we 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 respond to the uh, to, to 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 the threat uh, in the appropriate way that is supposed to be done, and we continue to for support in that area. So, lastly, maybe just because uh, David just uh, asked me to give a perspective about what I see as the role for AI in terms of uh, in terms of the emerging uh, crops uh, uh, diseases that have been uh, happening in the world. I just like to say that I'm a firm believer that. Uh, artificial intelligence is actually the way to go. We have seen a number of benefits that it brings uh, compared to where we were before. One being uh, uh, support in terms of actually uh, uh, coming up with, uh, uh, in terms of first increasing the efficiency in terms of any work environment. And different studies have shown that uh, uh, AI will replace a number of jobs uh, which were actually manual. So we believe that uh, with artificial intelligence, the time that is being used will, is actually reduced in terms of actually, but the precision of the technology in terms of giving out uh, real-time data that is actually accurate uh, and precise is something that is paramount, important, and I think we as African countries need to really step up and sure, make sure that we we adapt uh, to such technologies. Uh, a very good case study would be, I think, uh, the Nelson Mandela uh, University has been, uh, they have uh, the artificial intelligence uh, department where they've been coming up with different mobile applications to detect uh, different crops. I think, I believe there's one for maize and, uh, and, and a number of crops that have been coming up with different technologies and they have been very, really useful uh, to the community at large, but actually even to us as a, as a country because uh, of the uh, data that we get out of that, but the precision that we get out of that. So uh, I'm a firm believer that this is the way that we should go because uh, furthermore, the AI help us to make faster decisions, but furthermore also uh, to make sure that we, as humans, we can make errors, but with uh, artificial intelligence, the room for error is actually uh, very small. And furthermore, we are thinking of how can we automate everything? We are seeing that most things are now going to digital. Uh, uh, and this would be one of the key areas that we are thinking on how we can digitalize every aspect of our agriculture because that will definitely help us to increase our productivity at a large scale, but at the same time, uh, help us to increase our food security, but also furthermore to export. Uh, so I think for now, I should pause there, David, and get back to you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Great, thank you so much for that very uh, helpful overview and also the the important role that AI can play. So then we'll go into the presentation by the engineers here, and I believe the first person will be Milsort. Over to you.
Okay, thank you everyone. Uh, welcome to today's presentation. Um, thank you, Junior, for that well elaborated uh, presentation. So uh, we're going ahead to discuss on the Banana AI. And uh, Banana AI is one of our models that we've been working on, and it is on the Plant Village um, app. So the Banana AI is an offline object detection enabled surveillance, uh, which enables surveillance in remote areas. So for places where we don't have um, outreach, the network outreach, uh, Banana AI works there. And currently we have um, uh, different um, different uh, diseases being diagnosed, which uh, includes the banana bunchy top. We have the banana xanthomonas wilt, that is the BXW. We have the black and yellow cigatokas and also the healthy class. So um, these uh, symptoms, the symptoms of diseases are being recognized on the fruits, uh, the leaves, the same, and also the buds. Um, we have uh, we have trained the model with more than uh, seventeen thousand images from different countries, and currently we have a version that uh, we've trained on the uh, one is nutrition deficiency, and we're working on fusarium wilt. Uh, so if you look at the videos, you'd see how the banana model works. And, and how um, if you scan the plants, you can see how it detects the banana uh, bunchy top. And also if the plant is healthy, you can see um, that it, it will pick out an healthy plant and those that are, that are infected. So if you go to the model on the Plant Village app, you can easily um, use it to scan the different diseases that we've already uh, trained on. Uh, so the next slide, I'll talk about um, optimization. So when we do surveillance, we have the field officers, we have farmers who are doing surveys in the field. So all the surveys um, in the field, so when the farmer uh, does surveys to check the plants for any diseases, the, the, the model runs an inference and uh, give diagnosis um, give diagnosis to the like it gives diagnosis um to the farmer or the experts or to the field officers who are using the model based on the detections so if it is a healthy plan uh it will say this is an healthy plan if it is infected with banana bunchy top or any other uh diseases it will say uh this is um an healthy plan a disease plan and gives um management from there and then all the surveys are uploaded on our AI observatory. And there we have the human experts. So we have experts for different crops and we have experts for banana. So um, the experts check individual surveys and looks on the leaves and uh, those images that have been uploaded and then uh, sign diagnosis for all correct um, diagnosis where the AI says this is an healthy plan and the human expert says this is an healthy plan. Um, then we have those that are diseased and uh, human says these are diseased. So we have those that are misdiagnosed uh, by the AI. Let's say maybe it is a banana bunch top or it is a tomana's wilt and uh, the AI picks it as um, as healthy. So for those, we pull down the images and all images are moved to the misdiagnosed, like all misdiagnosed images are pulled for annotations. So we have a team in Eldoret, we have a team in Malawi, we also um, are getting a, a new team where we'll be working on doing annotations. So we have a team in Eldoret currently working in, uh, in Kenya, that is working on annotations. So all misdiagnosed images are annotated and labeled with the correct diagnosis. And then the images are integrated into the training and now everything moves to Qflow where we train the model. So mm -hmm. by adding the misdiagnosed images, we are able to train the model and say, um, this is, let's say if it is a banana uh, bunch top, this is banana bunch top. And then compare our current model let's say this is version 20.1 and 20.2. So the current uh, version 
and the and the previous version, we compare it and see whether it's performing well or not. So if the model is performing well, we update um, our production model, and now it is used by it's it's like used by the field officers and the and the and the farmers in a, in the field. Uh, if the model doesn't perform well, it goes around the same process. So that we go back to getting the misdiagnosed images and then um, run the annotation, give labels, and then it runs all through to training and the process go, goes on like that, as, as it's shown in the, in the diagram. Uh, then from there, we, um, we, we uh, previous, no, uh, to, uh, next, next slide, please. Okay, so on the observatory, we'll just go deep into into um, some some what we do on the observatory. So you can look at this. We have uh, different images, like four 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 images on the left, where we have the banana plants. So you will see uh, some of the plants. Uh, most of like all the plants are infected, and so on the observatory, you uh, we have the banana survey. So this uh, display shows you all the surveys that we have real time. And then uh, you, you, the experts are able to click on each survey and you would see um, on the right side, we, the, how the, the detection is done. Like the, if you compare the AI detection, so on the left side, you can see the AI detection. And also we have the expert detect, uh, expert that, uh, diagnosis or expert um di diagnosis for that particular that particular survey so if it is an healthy plan if it is a diseased plan and the and the ai picked it as disease and then that goes through uh but those misdiagnosed is now like you have to click on them and then say maybe change change the diagnosis to uh banana bunch top or banana xanthomonas or cigatoka uh in um and then confirm the survey so we have Taiwo from IITA who also is one of the people who does uh the confirmation of the survey is an expert in banana and is the one who's been helping us with banana bunch top from Tanzania so uh this is our observatory and this is um like well, uh, the activities that take place when we have the surveys uploaded to the observatory. So I'll hand it over to Pete to continue from here. Thank you. Thanks, Milsart. Yeah, so um, when we find a mismatch between the, the human diagnosis and the AI diagnosis, um, that's when the image gets kicked over to um, this panel and we're able to identify uh, images that have been misdiagnosed. So we've been focusing mostly on BBTV. Um, and so for that case, when we want to improve the performance for the banana AI on BBTV, we're mostly looking for two sets of images. Um, and so the first set is where the human diagnosis says that there was bunchy top present. Um, but the AI did not. So, so we're able to set a couple different things here. And so we're able to choose what the human diagnosis is. We're able to choose, we're able to exclude any human diagnosis. We're able to see or choose what it, only what the AI said or exclude what the AI said. So the first set we're interested in is when the human said that bungee top was present, but the AI said it was absent. Um, or it did not say it was present, this falls under the category of false negatives. Um, and so when we take these images in, we'll label them as uh, the correct human diagnosis here as bungee top disease. Um, and so that will help the model understand that the symptoms that it did not previously recognize as bungee top are in fact bungee top. The other set of images that we're interested in is actually the sort of the inverse. So that one would be where we have the AI di diagnosis being BBTV, and we would exclude any diagnosis from the human um, for BBTV. So that means basically that the AI said BBTV was present, 
but the human said, no, there was no BBTV there. And so that falls under the category of, of false positives. Um, and so in that case, we would take those images down and, and, and label them what the correct diagnosis should be. Um, and, and, and again, we can use the human diagnosis here to, to determine what that correct diagnosis should be. Um, so once we pull these images over, um, we go through a, a fairly simple annotation process, which you can see here, where we, um, because we're doing object detection for the banana AI, our annotation process is basically drawing bounding boxes. And so each one of these bounding boxes has, uh, of course, the dimensions that, that tell you where to put the box in the image. But then there also is a, a label that you can see here that's associated with each box that we draw. Um, and so this is our BBTV leaf label. And so we use these labels for any, any leaves in an image that show symptoms of BBTV. Um, and so here you can see just an example of, of drawing the boxes um, nicely over the leaf. So you can you include all of the edges of the leaf, but they're not um, covering too much of the area outside of the leaf. Um, so it's definitely not the most exciting part of the process, uh, but it is absolutely the most important part um, because effectively what we're doing when we, we say we're training the model is uh, we're, we're trying to teach it to draw boxes the way that these boxes are drawn. And so uh, it's, it's, it's critically important to, to draw these boxes correctly uh, and consistently from one image to another. And so we spent a lot of time over the past uh, year or two uh, working on protocols to make sure that all these annotations are done at, at a high degree of accuracy, um, because otherwise we're, we're not going to achieve the results we're looking for. So the next step after we get these images annotated is to uh, kick them over to Kubeflow and run a training session. And so um, this is just a, a short, or um, sorry, a, a brief uh, diagram of sort of the process that happens uh, within Kubeflow. And this is something that Derek Moore on our team uh, put together. And so basically what we do in Kubeflow is the first thing we do is we provision uh, a compute node and that compute node has uh, a GPU associated with it and some storage as well. And so that's what's happening here. And then the next step is in parallel, we download a number of different things. So we have the training data, the uh, pre-trained model checkpoint, which we are going to fine tune from uh, the label map uh, to associate the class IDs to the label names, the evaluation data and the config to kind of put it all together. And then we list everything out to make sure it all got downloaded correctly. And then uh, the next step is then again, in parallel, we're running a training job and evaluation job. And so then we can kind of monitor the performance on the validation set uh, while the training is running. And at the end, everything gets uh, copied over to S3 so that we can um, do some more analysis and then actually put the model into the phone if we decide it's worthy. Um, and then the last step is to just clean things up. So like I said, we were actually running the evaluation during the training session. So that allows us to plot some graphs that we see here using TensorBoard and compare uh, the evaluation performance from one training session to another uh, or one model version to another. And so typically um, we're from one, one model version to another, we're, we're adding data to, to the training data set. So we're not actually expecting necessarily to see significant improvements in the performance of these scores because it's new data. Um, it's not necessarily going to be easier to recognize. It's, it's actually data that the previous version of the model did not get correct. Um, so we would just use these scores to really just to make sure that the current version uh, or the new, newest trained model is at least on par with the previous versions. Um, and then we do, if we do find this uh, is the case that they're on par, then we'll uh, go ahead to the next step and actually put that model into production. And then that allows us to generate um, graphics like this where uh, we can compare the human labels to the AI labels like we've been talking about. And this, again, relies heavily on the human experts going to the observatory, like Milsor was mentioning, and as assigning the, the, their diagnosis to each of the, the, the images. 
Uh, without that, we we have no human labels here. Um, but with with the help of of experts, we're able to 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 generate plots like this, and this helps us see. So um, across the top here, we have what the human expert had assigned to the individual image, and then we have what the AI had labeled for that image. Um, and so you can see here, there's 663 uh, images in this case where um, the the AI and the human agreed that they were both bunchy top. Uh, but there was uh, 522 cases down here where the AI said it's unknown, it wasn't sure, um, and the human said it was bunchy top. And so these are, uh, when you're talking about bunchy top, these are bunchy top false negatives. So the AI did not recognize it, but this, the human said it was present. So we would take these images and label them as BBTV if we haven't already done that. I think we probably have at this point and then retrain the model, and then the next version will be able to recognize those, those symptoms better. Um, and then if we want to drill down even further uh, to look specifically at you know, BBTV performance from one, one model version to another, again, this is work uh, done by Derek Moore and our team to, to help us really compare when you're when you're looking at one model version to another, and these are these are coming from um, again the observatory where we see the agreement or disagreement from the human to, and the AI on production uh, surveys. So we're able to just make sure that you know from one version to another we we're we're having pretty good accuracy. Uh, we had a, a problem with precision before where we had a lot of false positives for BBTV. So we've been working on cleaning that up. Um, and, and we have a pretty high specificity now with our, our most recent model. So to tie it back to um, BBTV and, and the importance uh, or the impact on that on bananas, once we have this AI in production, we're doing all this model optimization stuff of all the time, but then on the other side of things, we're able to um, do AI-enabled surveillance across a wide, wide-scale area, um, and and identify the locations, even from country to the state, uh, where we recognize different diseases based on the phenotypes. And of course, we'll have to um, go and either confirm on the ground with a, a genotypic uh, data collection sampling, um, or or at least. Uh, confirm the phenotype by human experts on the panel. So you can't talk about um, AI in 2024 and not mention um, ChatGPT and Gemini um, and, and also generally multimodality. So this is not a, a feature that we have necessarily built out for banana specifically yet. Um, but we have another survey within the Plant Village app where you can uh, upload a picture uh, of, en of any crop that you have and any problem that you have. And then we have people on the back end um, providing advice or assigning the threats uh, that they identify in the images and then providing advice on how to manage those threats. And so we've been trying to, to leverage these large language models. Um, and more recently, Gemini, which is a multimodal model, which multimodality is just um, the integration of multiple types of different data uh, uh, structures types. So you could have a, a, the integration of images and language. Um, that's a, a big one for Gemini. You could also have um, the combination of images and sound. Um, and so what we've done is, is actually built and, and fine-tuned our own version of ChatGPT uh, to uh, take in information, basically just the crop and the threat, um, and suggests some advice for the farmer to, to manage that threat. So um, here we have an example where we have cow peas and insect damage. And, and I'm gonna go ahead and, and get ready to send a, a message to the uh, user, and it's kind of hard to see down here, but there's a little AI button that when you press it, um, we automatically populate this, this text box. And you can see here, there's uh, the advices. There's several ways to treat insect damage in cow peas. Uh, you can use insecticide soap, neem oil, um, but you can also have introduced you know, beneficial insects like ladybugs uh, or lace wings. Um, and so that, that, that's, that, that could, dramatically in increased um, the amount of surveys which a human expert could um, respond to without having to type out this entire message themselves. So here we have one for, for maize and fungus. Um, 
and we'll see that there's different types of fungus that affect maize, so it's important to identify, to identify the specific one, um, and you can consult your local agricultural extension officer. I'm running out of time, so I'm just going to um, move on to the last one, which is an example where we see um, uh, a crop of beans that, that's threatened by uh, wilting, um, and, and we can see the AI advice here is is to say that wilting in beans can be caused by a various number of different things, such as uh, overwatering, underwatering, pests or diseases to treat the wilting in your beans. You should first identify the cause of the problem. Um, and, and it continues on there. So this, this is uh, just the very beginning of the integration of, of our ChatGPT model. And we're going to continue to uh, work on the integration of multimodality so that we could um, really, really increase the the use case of AI in, in um, for tackling current and emerging threats to crops. So that I think we'll say thanks and um, open up for some discussion and questions. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, uh, Pete and, and Millsort and also Junior again. So folks, um, I'm sure there's a lot of questions from this really excellent overview uh, of, of AI. So please uh, feel free to type them in or unmute yourself. I was just responding to one question by Steen. Um, I, I can answer I can answer that or, or you can look at that yourself, Pete. But uh, Steen Hoyer there asked about diagnostics and asked are molecular diagnostics currently used to support a human expert? So why don't you or others have a go at that, please? Yeah, so um, we are we are doing genetic testing for the diagnosis as well. Um, and we have in we have developed a system within the Plant Village app to actually link um, be able to link um, samples that you collect in the field using a QR code, uh, which you could then uh, connect to the, the phenotypic images that you collect through the app. Um, and so then you could link together uh, a genetic um, sequence to a, a phenotype and understand that uh, maybe for the case of asympt asymptomatic uh, BBTV infections, there, there is a strong indicator and in, in genetic sequence, but there is not maybe a, a phenotypic sim symptoms. So yes, we are working on doing the, the genetic diagnosis in the field and then also linking that on the back end to the phenotype so that we could uh, also, we could eventually use those images uh, to retrain the model as well if um, you, it's not immediately obvious to the eye of the human in the image, but we know it's there in the genetic sequence then we could potentially use those images to train the model to identify really, really subtle symptoms that maybe the, the human eye doesn't necessarily see. Great, thank you so much. Uh, more questions from the audience? Are people able to easily unmute and ask, or you need to type? I'm happy to see 107 people on the call, so I'm sure there's some really good questions out there. <laughs> Yes, hi David. Uh, hello, David. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Please go ahead, Junior. Yeah, I've seen a number of uh, questions in the chat about uh, uh, the different uh, types, uh, varieties of cassava, and which ones are suitable. But also, some asking about the best practices for weed control. Others on that the intercropped or with other, if it can be intercropped with other uh, crops. Maybe just to start, I can just respond to a few. Uh, yes, uh, yes, it, uh, cassava can be intercropped with other crops, uh, basically maize and legumes. 
could be could be could be appropriate uh, uh, crops for you to to do that. In terms of uh, what different varieties, well, they are different. There's sweet cassava, vita cassava. There are maybe almost ten 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 uh, varieties of cassava, uh, and definitely it will depend on their uh, agroecological zone which the person is. I'm not so sure. I can, it looks like the person is in, is in Kenya and I'm currently in Tanzania, so I might not be the right person to advise uh, what kind of uh, type, what type of cassava variety would be appropriate for them. Yeah. And yeah, so basically just to answer, and then there's another one called, another question on the, uh, just uh, about the BBTV vectors. Is it easily... Is it easier to control the vectors or use tissue culture? Well, I think David, maybe you can add on this. I don't yeah. think it's that easy uh, to control the vectors because it depends on that they tend to migrate from time to time based on the proximity proximity of the uh, plantains which are there. Uh, but uh, basically, uh, would advocate for the use of tissue culture as because they're they're mostly uh, the tissue culture technology is free of pest diseases it can basically handle that more than compared to the the normal varieties or the traditional varieties that we have but yes it can be controlled but we'll advocate rather to use uh, um, tissue culture instead of the local varieties because they're susceptible to pest and diseases more compared to the 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 tissue culture. I think for now, uh, over to you, David. Great. Well, um, I'm glad you picked up on Catherine's questions. Uh, it, it's really fabulous that Catherine is a farmer uh, from from uh, Eastern Kenya, and she's asked some questions. We've answered them. You've answered them. And Annalise has already connected to her t or reached out to one of our team members in the Eastern area who will, Mercy, who will connect directly with Catherine. So she'll get her direct uh, in-person response. So that's fantastic and showing the power of platforms. Um, indeed, we, 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 we are focused very much on controlling the aphid vector. That's a really important part. You can think of this like the importance of controlling mosquitoes for eradicating malaria or reducing its burden. So we're heavily involved in a large program where we are working with farmers and local extension services in order to optimize the the outreach component and then the spraying of infected mats and the destruction of, of infected mats. We want to turn that into a, a beneficial product uh, through the process of pyrolysis to make biochar. We, at the same time, are working very closely with uh, companies, for example, Maui, Missouri in, Ken in Tanzania, whereby we are scaling up tissue culture, that's a really important part, and also macro propagation. So all of those things should be going synergistically so that we can really double down on the, the overall effect that we we um we we have. So that's an important point. Um uh and, and then we had a, just a comment there from uh, Limio Hamad, uh, who is the deputy uh, director of the Tanzanian Plant Health and Pesticide Authority and a fabulous uh, supporter of all of the efforts across multiple sectors for the eradication of BBTV. And, and it's great to have you on the call. So thank you so much indeed uh, for your su continued support. Um, uh, Limio, really appreciate that. Um, Joshua, Justin, uh, what are the available chemical treatments or pesticides that can be used to control and mitigate the impact of banana bunched up virus uh, in banana plantations? Uh, if you don't mind, Pete or, or, or Millsort, I can take that if you like, or unless you, okay. Um, so there, there's lots of them. There, 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 are, there are synthetic chemicals that are just well-known insecticides that can be used. We, as the current Emerging Threats of Crops Innovation Lab, are really looking at an integrated pest management approach because what we don't want to do is select for resistance in the aphid, which is the vector, because that could actually make the problem much worse. There are many large-scale programs whereby we're trying to eradicate vectors of human diseases or plant diseases. And if you use a lot of synthetic chemicals, then you can select for resistance and then you, you lose that control. So what we're trying to do is advocate the use of uh, 
uh, situations like botanicals like neem or soapy water. So aphids have a very waxy cuticle. So if we spray the uh, soapy water on them, you you reduce that wax and you you kill them. In addition, aphids have a co-evolved relationship with ants. And so the, the application of the soapy water and neem stops the ants coming to them, which allows the uh, flying insects like parasitoids or crawling insects like ladybirds, lady beetles to go and attack them. So that's a way to integrate the predation or parasitism with the spraying approach. The other reason we advocate for uh, botanicals or, or or low toxicity chemicals like soapy water is the problem that happens routinely in many locations where people get poisoned because of uh, this one. That's an important part um, that we we want to avoid that. And so these are the two elements here. We in our part, a lot of our work, for example, in fall armyworm, we release parasitoids. So we also are looking for effective control. We have heard some interesting stuff regarding the use of a fungus called metarhizium from Cameroon. So we'll be practicing on that. Um, Irene, I think you said it was a question from Maggot from, from FAO you wanted to answer. Uh, yes, I can pick that up. Yep. The person asked, is the crop stage affecting the accuracy of the AI model? To what extent could we count on the AI to identify BBTV in planting materials? So at the moment, our model uses computer vision. And as we know, sometimes the BBTV infected plants can portray um, symptoms where they have stunted growth. And sometimes probably the model could have false negatives where it could detect BBTV in small plants. So to counter that, we collected young plants as well, and they are integrated into the model. So at the moment, you can just use a grown plant that can detect, that can show BBTV to be able to tell if the AI can detect BBTV and give you based on the same. Yeah, and thank we're you. currently, thank you so much, that's a great answer, and we're currently working on a workshop at the moment happening with IITA in Dar es Salaam, where we are building in the capacity to use tools like LAMP, which is a quick diagnostic genetic test, so that can be used in addition to the AI model. Thank you so much, Margaret. Uh, Valerie had a question, what are the main challenges faced by Tanzanian farmers in adopting tissue cultured plantits for banana cultivation? Uh, just very quickly, it's always access. Uh, we need to make it as simple as possible for, for farmers in the global south to be able to access things that farmers in the global north have access to all day long. So bring bring it to their field. That's the important point. Um, uh, I think maybe we can just add on that, uh, David. Uh, I, 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 uh, one thing that maybe we, uh, we, we have also noticed uh, basically in terms of the adoption of the tissue culture plantains, uh, they, I think one of the key challenges has been the culture. Uh, the culture in terms of, uh, uh, I, I remember we once went to a field uh, where there was a, a lady, uh, and actually this was just a very grand lady around 96 years old, and we were telling, uh, and actually all our field was actually affected by BBTV, and we're actually advising her uh, to, you know, uh, kind of uh, remove all the affected plantains, and we provide her with the tissue culture uh, plantains, but she refused to do that because of the culture that uh, basically when she planted the bananas, uh, that was when she married her husband and her late husband has died. And that is kind of uh, uh, when she sees the banana, she has an attachment with uh, with her husband and she doesn't want to remove them. So we uh, we advocated for that and we, we realized that there could be an issue of culture. And sometimes people may be thinking that tissue culture uh, plantains are uh, maybe GMO plantains, different odds which are not really true. So one of the key areas that uh, 
we as USAID have invested on is and we look forward to do is to make sure we work very closely with CETSIL uh, and IITA to uh, increase the awareness across the country uh, by using different uh, uh, models. One, by using cartoons. We have been uh, po producing posters and all that, which are both in uh, the languages, local languages, which can be easily uh, understandable to the people, uh, but furthermore, using radios, uh, campaigns, so that uh, we can reach to the livelihood and they could understand that they mention and even remove the rhetoric thinking about uh, the, 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 the tissue culture plantains. So this, this is just to respond to the challenge. Yes, there are challenges. And of course, David, as you said, uh, there is an issue of access, uh, but also the prices of uh, uh, the tissue culture plantains. But this is something that we are looking forward on how best we can address so that it becomes accessible, but affordable to uh, the Tanzanian citizens and even the farmers, basically the banana farmers in the country. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. Uh, the next question on AI is, other than detection, does the AI quantify the level of diseases? Uh, Milsort? Uh, the question is, other than the detection, does the AI quantify the level of diseases? Yes. So uh, while you're scanning the, while you're, you're doing the surveys, the AI is able to tell you uh, the percentage of infection. Like if it is ninety percent infected, eighty percent infected, so it will um, it will tell you how um, how how the plant is infected. And the other thing also, we have a way where you can scout. You can scout the whole farm, and then you can get a uh, infection rate on the the whole farm for that particular farmer. Yep. Great, excellent. Um... Uh, somebody asked, um, I'm just looking for any other, um, Maggot asked, what is the ma what is the matter, the level of the infestation? infestation? I didn't understand the question. Um, okay. Um, so then there's a one from um, Bonfus about, do we have varieties that are more susceptible or more resistant? We don't have any varieties that are resistant to BBTV, but we do have uh, th those who which are which are more tolerant of it, um, and that's just ongoing research in order to explore those. We know that in Uganda there are some varieties which are preferred by local people, and and that's being brought across the border from DRC, and that's driving the in infection, uh, or, or at least the the spread of it. Um, Okay, I think we're coming up on time. We'll have a few other questions that we can address as I might get clarified. Once the plant is infested, it doesn't matter the level of infestation or the damage. Um, true, it, it's it's a, an infected plant, um, but it matters the level of infestation because it can be asymptomatic. So you may have an infected plant, which which is then being classified as healthy even though it has an infection inside it and if the surveyor was to go into that location and then move on from that location then they would say it was healthy this is why for those plants which look uninfected but are infected so called asymptomatic we want to make sure we also do a genetic test just like we have become familiar with those kind of approaches for covid so that's an important, that's why we're integrating genetic testing with the AI sampling. Thank you so much. Okay, um, everybody, we're at time. Uh, this has been really excellent. We will, of course, uh, post this on our channel. Uh, we wanted again, thank Junior for taking time out of his busy day to be with us and for his continued and fantastic uh, advocacy for a integrated and, and locally owned uh, approach to controlling banana budget of virus. So it's been really great. It's been phenomenal to see two AI engineers uh, from 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 Kenya here, Irene and Milsort. Uh, also phenomenal that th these are young women who are who are leading the AI revolution in Africa. Uh, phenomenal to have Pete McCloskey as our lead AI engineer uh, acting in the role of teacher for these with this next generation. This is absolutely fantastic and, and really something that we're all incredibly proud of to see how we are developing this capacity. If you have any 
questions, follow-ups, please reach out to us. Uh, thank you so much indeed. Uh, thank you so much, Annalise, for 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 uh, having this poll, for organizing it so well and, and just getting us through the uh, issues which are, which are just a second in our series. And we want to introduce more and more. So also reach out to us with any questions for topics for what you would like to see. But everybody, thank you so much. Uh, as we say, it takes the village. Yes. And we love having you all here. So thanks very much. Thank you so much, uh, David. And I'll just like to uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, to present today and uh, to congratulate you for the work that you have done with TPHPA uh, on providing access to knowledge in real time, actionable data through plant AI. So uh, well deserved. And let's keep the ball moving. And I believe youth, it's a, it's, it's a time, it's a high time for us to uptake the artificial intelligence to the next level, mostly for Africans. Thank you. Thank you so much indeed. Okay. Thanks, everybody.